Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Discover Christian Mysticism with John Adams. I'm John Adams. Today, I'm going to introduce you to someone very special. His name is Mike Adams. He is a New Testament scholar, especially focusing on the New Testament languages. He was an evangelical free church pastor for over 40 years. He still does the pastor thing because you can take a pastor out of a church, but you can't take the pastor out of a pastor. And he's also my dad. In this conversation, I asked him a lot of questions about his own spiritual formation. I asked him about his experience of being called to ministry and getting educated in evangelical higher education. I asked him about his experience as an evangelical pastor for so long in the United States and in Canada. And um, I asked him his perspective on where this whole American Christianity thing is headed. Talking to him in this way, really helped me put a lot of the pieces together to understand his perspective. And I hope that you appreciate his experience and his perspective that he was gracious enough to share with us. Um, This was recorded this summer, this past summer um, in the old studio. And I know there's some audio and some video issues and looking at that video and trying to fix those things convinced me to remodel around here and get our new setup. So just bear with me on the technological side. And uh, again, thank you, Dad, for sharing your experience. If you'd like to get in touch with me or respond to this at all, then you can leave a comment in the comment section below, or you can send me an email at john at withjohnadams.com. That's J-O-N, John with no H, at withjohnadams.com. As always, thank you for watching, and uh, I hope you enjoy this very long, very detailed conversation with my dad. Why don't you tell me a little bit about what it was like when you came to know the Lord and the people who brought you to the Lord and what your call to ministry was like? Oh, wow. Those are really good questions. Um, When I came to know the Lord, um, many people don't believe me when I say this, but it's true. Um, I was in jail. I had committed crimes and I was locked away for three months for exactly what um, is really not of concern because my personal opinion is that people that emphasize on how bad they used to be take the shine off of Jesus and put it on themselves in kind Mm -hmm. of a perverted um, way that I don't appreciate. So I have not really ever uh, spent a lot of time sharing my testimony. Um, But yeah, I was in jail, and I was kind of at uh, 19 years old, and I was kind of at a um, sort of a crossroads in my life. Um, I was ignorant and an unbeliever, and I didn't know I was ignorant and an unbeliever. I didn't know about Jesus. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I heard a few things here and there. A couple of military chaplains did their best to share Christ with me. And uh, I invited them to stay away from me uh, because I could not understand anything that they were talking about. It was all gobbledygook, knew nothing about the Bible. And I was a high school dropout, so I considered myself to be stupid. And uh, and I was okay with that. You know, the world needs stupid people, so I signed up for being that. So what exactly happened was, it was a Baptist chaplain, and uh, he visited me in jail and invited me to come to a service where he was going to preach a message. And I said to him, I bet you're not a good preacher. And he said, why? And I said, because good preachers don't have to go around asking people to come and hear them. I didn't know what I was saying. I was just really um, a smart aleck in those days. Like, I was well known as a smart aleck. And so um, the look on his face was like, you know, I could lead you to Christ or I could choke you out. Um, Where else do you have to go? And I said, I don't have any place to go because I'm locked in a cage. And he said, 
they'll let you out of that cage if you come to church on Sunday. And so I went to his little chapel thing. There were three of us in the audience, maybe four. Uh, one guy sitting right next to me over here was wearing a blanket, and I realized he was stark naked. And he had sworn off clothing, which might explain why he was in a little cage. But he was also guilty of, um, well, he was accused of stabbing somebody to death. And so I figured, yeah, he's got, if I have problems, he has worse problems. And then somebody else was there that I never connected with. And so this Baptist guy, Joel K. Wallace, stood up, began to preach from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, and um, morphed into 15. And I had no idea there was a Gospel called Mark, um, nor did I know there were actually four Gospels. I did not literally know the difference between the Old Testament and the New Although, um, yeah, I really didn't. And he starts preaching about Jesus coming into the world and dying for sin. And all of a sudden, it occurred to me, everything that he was saying is the truth and made total sense. And I was like, wow, what's happening to me? Because... That was not my normal mode when it came to people who were Christians. Mm. We used to mock Christians in my family, and my dad used to say things like, I'd be a Christian except I know one. Uh, what was another one of his famous sayings? Um, I would go to church if I could afford it, you know, stuff like that. And my mother had no interest in things spiritual, even though she was raised in a Methodist family. She just saw the hypocrisy of a lot of liberals um, and thought, you know, who needs this? So we were close to anti-religious. We didn't hang out with those people. After the sermon, I went up to him and I said, I'm sorry to say this, but most of what you said made total sense to me. And I don't have any background or interest in this stuff. And I'm just wondering why. And he said, well, you are a sinner in need of salvation. And I thought about poking his pointy nose, but that would have gotten me more time in the little cage. And I said, all right, explain yourself. And the next thing I knew, we were on our knees and I was confessing my sins and um, asking for the forgiveness of my sins in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Fast forward, he baptized me in a font. It wasn't even a bap baptismal. The thing about Baptists is they take their name seriously. And I was baptized. Of course, I was a little bit smaller individual then. But I was baptized in about a six or seven inch font, which was really the base of what we would call a shower stall. Um, in a Catholic chapel because um, he felt some urgency about it and he had to virtually stand on me to get all of me underwater but again it was an easier task back in the day and he accomplished that and gave me a baptismal certificate and fast forward a week or two he comes up to me and hands me a Bible now, he had been preaching and reading from the Bible, and I was so confused about the whole thing. And uh, so um, I, I looked at this little Bible that he gave me, and I read it, and I said, are there bigger Bibles that you can actually read that aren't written in uh, little teeny tiny uh, letters? And um, he said, yes, I recommend the Thompson Chain Reference Bible. And I was like, who knows what he's talking about? I said, I want one. He said, well, you have to buy one. And so just last week, I, I found this certificate where I drew some money out of the bank to buy my first Bible. And it was a King James Version of the Thompson Chain Reference Bible, the best purchase I ever made in my life. And... Um, 
I remember sitting in front of that Bible and praying every single day, Lord, this whole thing does make, makes no sense to me whatsoever. Help me to understand one thing, just one. That's all I'm asking. Just help me to understand one thing. And that began my love affair with the scriptures. And I mean, it still goes strong to this day, as you can attest. Um, what the Bible says and what it means, I have found that I got born into a family of people, most of whom don't know what the Bible says, really. They're too busy to take the time, even though at home they own 10 Bibles. And um, they actually think of themselves as wise and spiritual when they have right in front of them this book that God prepared for us, but they really don't understand it. Now, having spent over 40 years as a preacher, I can tell you that a lot of their confusion comes from us preachers. Um, we do not, as a general rule, do a good job, and we don't do the scriptures justice. But that's probably something you're going to ask me later. So then I got my uh, GED and enrolled in a college under academic probation, a Bible college. And I just went to town learning the scriptures, um, learning biblical languages, Greek and Hebrew. Um, and uh, I just really immersed myself in that. I became the person that was so studious that the entire campus made fun of me. Um, I could not get enough of it, and there was no way that I was ever again going to allow myself to be in a position where I had to depend on somebody else to tell me what the Bible says. And so I had the benefit of a good preaching pastor. He was not such a good man sometimes in other ways, but as a, as a preacher of Bible and theology, um, my first pastor was second to none, and I memorized pretty much every sermon that came out of his mouth, and that gave me a good foundation and a place to start, but it was always me and the Bible, and it's still me and the Bible. So when I was in Bible college, people used to say, someday you're going to be a pastor. There's one thing on this planet I never wanted to engage in was being a pastor, so yeah. you went to Bible school just to learn the Bible? It wasn't yes, like, oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. I never wanted to be a professional Christian um, because it just, the whole church game seemed so foreign to me. I had no background in it. So who was I to step forward and say, I'll be a leader in this game? And I really rebelled against it and resisted it. Um, all the way through college, I resisted it when I became a pastor for the first time, and I resisted it after being an interim pastor in two churches, uh, when I went to Trinity Divinity School for biblical studies. I wanted nothing to do with pastoral education, and, uh... I didn't want anything to do with the ministry, but your mother and a friend of mine named Mike Bogar, who has since denied his faith and has walked away from Christ, um, your mother and Mike Bogar uh, really kept after me all the time. You belong in ministry. Uh, don't turn your back on that calling. And it's like, how would you know what God is calling me to do? And finally, one day in uh, Illinois, when I was at Trinity Divinity School, I turned over in bed and I looked at the wall and I said, Okay, Lord, even if you want me to be a pastor, because people wanted me to be their pastor. It's, I have never been in a place... Um, prior to my retirement, where I was without someone who said, we want you to pastor our church, which is another interesting aspect of it. 
So I became a pastor, and um, I'd like to say that I had the time of my life, but I resented it uh, all the way down until the last 10 years that I was a pastor. Um, And I just woke up one day and thought, well, God has called me to this, and I seem to be cut out for it. Um, But the rest of the time, I was there kicking and screaming, because the whole thing, the whole church thing, to me, just looking at it from an outsider's point of view, which I never lost the outsider's point of view, Hmm. was crazy, absolutely crazy. And then to attribute what we're doing to the Holy Spirit on most days is blasphemous, because we're running organizations. And we assume that if our organization is growing, we have God's blessing. Look. We would not, none of us, anybody that I know that believes the Bible is the word of God would, uh, would apply the same criteria to the Mormons. So here the Mormons are going to build you this great cathedral just up the road here on Trenton, right? And uh, are we going to say with their view of Jesus, which we've always taken to be heretical, that God is blessing them? Um, so, but why do we apply the same criteria to us? Most of us, I'm not one of those, but most of us, um, regard the Catholics with suspicion, but they have some really big churches with a lot of people in them. Are we going to say God is blessing them? Walmart's doing very well. Walmart is doing extremely well. Yeah. So are the Republicans. Right. And please don't get me started on them. I am a Republican, and I think we've gone crazy. But we still have about 65% of church people in America fully supportive of what the Republicans are doing, which is nuts. So, um, and it used to be 80%. I'm just appalled. We can't attribute church size to God's blessing. And um, that's just a game that we've always played that I never bought into when I was in the ministry. I just felt it was my duty every day to ask the Lord, okay, here's a new day. Thank you for this. What do you want me to do? And I know it's probably going to be something I don't want to do, but I had this way of saying I salute smartly and I do the will of God. So if you don't know God's will for your life today, if you're a pastor, somebody else will claim that they know God's will for your life. And they'll step all over your calling. And uh, so I was real serious about it. I may not have been willing. I was like the guy where... The Lord says, you know, um, two men were called and one man said, I'll go and didn't go. And the other man said, I won't go. And then ended up going. Which one did the Father's will? Well, the second one, even the Jews could figure that out. Well, I was the second one. Um, uh, Most of what I did over the years, I didn't want to do. But I had an intense sense that I was doing what God wanted me to do which contributed to the overall weirdness of what we call the church in this country. But basically, I was running programs, uh, running churches. There were some good things that came out of it. Um, and one of the good things I think I'd put up there really to the, at the top of the list is, by God's grace, over the years, I had five youth pastors And um, I let them and encouraged them to have an effect on my life. And all five of them had that effect on me. Um, My relationship to those guys, and they're all five still in ministry today. That is a hard thing for any pastor to claim. Because us pastors have a way of ruining youth pastors. Um, And subjecting them to things that are uh, counterproductive spiritually, uh, but I never did that. And I always, to this day, I think the number one thing I'm the most proud of 
in a biblical sense, not arrogantly proud, I don't think, is those five guys are all still in ministry. And uh, I didn't ruin them, basically, is what I'm saying. So some good things did happen. We built a bunch of church buildings and stuff like that. And, you know, it was all necessary stuff. But And I experienced a lot of periods of growth of ministries that I was a part of. And I experienced a lot of um, periods where... Like in John chapter 6, the Lord with his disciples, people just walked away and said, yeah, we don't get it. So, um, but all that time, I had a sense that that's where God wanted me to be, although I was always ready to do something else if the door opened up. Um, but then I, it ended up being six churches in my entire life. Um, so um, there we are. Yeah. In the meantime, John came along, and um, he's following God's will uh, for himself. Um, when you were in Bible school, did you meet anyone else who was just there to learn the Bible and who wasn't there to build like a career as a pastor? Or were you the, the only one? No. See, that would be... Um, acting too much like Elijah, wouldn't it? Like I'm the only one. No, because like uh, I remember when I applied to Bible school and to seminary, there's a page in the application where you have to explain why you feel called to ministry because they don't, they don't want to give you your like a biblical education without explaining what you're going to use it for. Okay. So, um, as far as that goes, when I went to college, I was on such academic probation, they weren't expecting me to last anyway. Mm -hmm. um, however, um, when I went to seminary, my line was, I'm probably going to end up being a pastor. And then I enrolled in programs that you would take if you were going to be a writer, an author, a uh, PhD candidate for uh, teaching in colleges or seminaries or something like that. But I, and so I was always at war with the administration over what do we do with this guy? Um, in the meantime, I ended up with some really famous professors and I didn't actually realize how famous they were, but they were teaching the subjects that I was interested in. And it always revolved around biblical backgrounds. Yeah. Like the Jewish, the Greek, um, the cultural Roman backgrounds to the New Testament has always piqued my interest a lot. But not just because of history, um, but because you can catch little rays of light shining on the biblical text from those things. There's a limit to how much those things can help you. And there's actually a severe limit to the amount of knowledge we have of New Testament times. Um, anybody who's an expert in that begins any lectures they do by saying, we, we don't have as much information as we make it out. So some of it is guesswork and stuff. So you've got to be careful. But that kind of thing has always really piqued my interest. Yeah. I wanted to know... When the Apostle Paul said something, for instance, and Pauline studies were my thing, that I could, I wanted to, as much as I could, put myself in the seat of the person that was hearing his letter mm. read out loud and have a sense of what it meant back then. Yeah. I always tried that. Yeah. It didn't always succeed, but I always tried that. Well, you can also never really know for sure, right? Well, yeah, we are, we're limited. Yeah. Okay. We're looking through a telescope uh, back 2,000 years. Yeah. You know, so, but yeah, so I, I felt called to the ministry on a very personal level. And my relationship with God is, and, and you were asking me if I had met people. Yes. In fact, I met people in the pastorate like me. Hmm. who, and to be honest with you, um, I, I learned not to respect pastors who
who seemed to think I was made for this. Hmm. All of the pastors I learned to respect who spoke to me spiritually at a, at a level below the surface, and all of the seminary students, and there were several uh, that I knew, um, that I respected and listened to, were people that were like me sort of dragged into this. And while they were there, they gave it their best shot. Yeah. Okay. And if you look up the uh, biographies of several really prominent preachers in the English-speaking world, you will see that most of them have the same story. Yeah. Most of them were doing something they didn't feel qualified for and didn't want to be qualified for, but had an intense sense, this is what God has called me to do, even though it seems like the Lord didn't ask me if I wanted to do this. So why do you think that that's what happens in church? Because I feel like uh, a lot of times with pastors, we'll enter Bible school or seminary or whatever um, because we feel pulled to a deeper relationship with God um, or we feel like God has called us to some kind of ministry. And a lot of times it's a very personal thing and has really very little to do with uh, – making money or making our names great as a preacher or whatever. And yet the people who come to church, a lot of, a lot of the times our, our motives for going to church are so different than the motives for the, of the people who are there to minister. And so like there's, it never feels like there's an alignment of desire for what the spiritual community is supposed to be. So like, you know, it's so strange. Like, uh, why would all these people keep showing up to hear somebody talk about things that they don't want to hear? And why would we keep signing up to talk to people who don't want to hear us or the things that we care about? Um, and why does that work? Well, I think we could talk all day about whether it does work. Right. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, I, I really think it's the Lord pulling them. So don't forget, this happened in the New Testament, right? Speaking about New Testament backgrounds. When Paul said, I'm the apostle to the Gentiles, he wasn't talking about street preaching. He was talking about preaching to Gentile, non-Jewish people who had already committed themselves to, in some measure to the fact that Jehovah is the right God. Okay. They were in love with Jehovah. They weren't so much in love with the Jews who had done so many strange things with their relationship to Jehovah. It was impossible to work with them much of the time. It's like it's impossible to work with a lot of church people. Um, but why does it work? In any church, now see, I'm really critical, super critical of people that come to church. Because I think a lot of times those motives are false. And I think they put pressure on us pastors to preach little sermonettes that really say nothing at all. To make them feel good, like we're giving them a saccharine pill on Sunday morning so they can go out now and wash their car or whatever. Like whenever anybody said, boy, you really went long today. I always ask them, am I keeping you from something? Like, do you have an appointment? We didn't lock you in here. The door's unlocked. Why are you here? And I was especially hard on elders, as you might remember, um, for the same reason. I think people's motives for coming to church are less than pure. And they're less about, often less about knowing God than about being in a social community that gives them some standing and status, and it's really not about growing close to God. Now, having said that, I found in every church that I pastored a group of people of whom that was not true. So as soon as I got out of uh, college and seminary, both, I would take a church as their pastor, and I would look out there and think, this whole thing is crazy. 
Like this person is a leader, that person's an elder, that person's a deacon, that person is, you know, whatever. And they had status and authority in the church, mostly based on the fact that they were there first. They were there before everybody else. And they were the loudest. They were demanding of my time. They asked me to do things that were a waste of time. And if I listened to them, they would have frittered away my entire life. And in fact, many times they did. And it would just drive me crazy. I would just say, Lord, you didn't call me here to do the, the will of people that don't intend to grow in their faith, but refuse to step aside so somebody else can. So many people like that. Now, most of my ministry, all of my ministry, basically, was done in the Evangelical Free Church of America. And we're like every other denomination. We believe that's not true of us. Mm. Now, it may be true of you Baptists, but that's certainly not true of us. It is true of us. Um, I never inherited an elder board that I could support. But I never pretended to support them either. As long as they were doing church games. Okay? So we, we had some tough meetings. Um, but... In every church, I would look out and I would see those people who know how busy I am and how hard I'm trying, who would never ask me for a minute of my time because they don't want to impose on me. And these are like, I used to compare them to those flowers that grow up through the cracks in the sidewalk. You can walk down a dirty old sidewalk and then you come across the most beautiful flower. There were lots of those. People who wanted nothing to do with being on boards or committees or any of that stuff that we fussed and fumed about and argued about all the time. They just wanted to know the Lord. And in every ministry that I ever was the pastor of, I eventually found those people and started to work with them. And they always had a hundred questions, but not about why, why do you keep the church at 68 degrees? I can't stand that. None of that stuff, that garbage, that waste of time. But they would have questions like, okay, um, about this passage in the Bible. I've always wondered about this. Or about their personal lives. I accepted the Lord. I don't think I'm going anywhere. How do I get to move ahead? Like in our uh, the, the study you had with the young people last night out at the gazebo, um, people who wanted to be at that commitment level, but nobody had ever shared with them, here's how you do this, okay? And, um, you know, people that I could meet with at lunch, men and women, um, and they were usually younger, okay? And often they had parents in the church that are always talking about, you know, what the church used to be, what the church could be, what the church, you know, isn't, what it is, blah, 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 blah. But they wanted no part of that. What they wanted was Jesus, okay? And I felt that at those moments in my ministry, when I finally found these people and what was really going on in their hearts and mind, that that was my responsibility from now on. Whether the church grew or didn't grow, that's not my problem. If you can meet your budget or not meet your budget, so what? God always takes care of us. Those were my people, and I would spend time with them. But then when I would preach, I would preach like <laughs> three different sermons in a single sermon, right? One for them, one for the people that are don't wake up and don't seem to have any interest in waking up. And then one for the group that's there, they're not sure why they're there. Somehow they got sucked into going to church or they thought they would try church and they have no idea um, what this whole thing is all about. And I had a, usually tried to have a sermon for those people. And I don't know if you remember this, John, but 
for much of my ministry, like when from the time you were just like a, a little guy, um, compared to your peers, you were never a little guy. But when you were littler than you are, um, you used to analyze my sermons and you used to try to figure out all the time what I was saying and what, why I preached that particular sermon. And then you'd ask me questions afterwards. Um, you had your way of categorizing things. And I'd be like, well, I don't know. I just made a sermon. I wasn't really being strategic like that. But you always knew that there was more to it than that. And um, so then, um, yeah, I, I always had more than one sermon on a given Sunday morning. How many... Uh like what percentage of people in a given church um, do you feel like are at that level or at that point where they want to engage more with, with the Lord and aren't as preoccupied with like the organization of things? Well, I've heard there have been different studies of this. Yeah, I know. But what do you think? The figure that always comes out is 20%. Yeah. And okay. So I have no way of gauging that. Right. Uh, I think some people have better motives than I give them credit for. Sure. And some people have worse motives for being involved in a church than I give them credit for. The Bible says that Jesus needed no one to tell him what was in the heart of man. Yeah. Well, I serve Jesus. I'm not Jesus. Right. Okay. So, but I would I would say 20% is a good figure. Now, that 20% can change. Yeah. Because some people fall away from the faith. Mm-hmm. Some people fall closer to Jesus. <laughs> uh, some people, um, you know, so I think the 20% is like a kaleidoscope. It's always yeah, getting refocused. But I wouldn't be surprised if it's 20%. Now, among children, especially children that are, say, Esther Sita's age and younger, I'll bet it's closer to 60%. Mm. Which is why... And this is why I love these kids so much. To many of them, I was a rock star at some point yeah. in my ministry where I would come to church and they would have stuff they drew for me at home all week. And they would draw stuff that would be pictures of a sermon that I preached or something like that, trying to come to terms with it. And they just seemed like they were at such an innocent stage like Esther where they really wanted to know the Lord and I was their their leader, so to speak. And their parents would say, um, wow, they just can't wait to come to church to see you, you know. Now it always changed. I could tell when, because you can't be a rock star in a kid's life forever. They go through so many changes, right? Their parents would say, oh, they, they can't wait to see Pastor Mike. And once in a while I would say, and what about you? Uh, well, yeah. I got to get over to Sunday school. <laughs> There's also a time in kids' lives where they like clowns, yes. and that's dumb. So, <laughs> um, Batman, they like Batman. Yeah. Yes, like Bizonte. Right. Yes. Okay. So, um, what percentage? I have another question I want to ask, but what percentage of of pastors do you think are actually in the ministry because they? And I know this is it's hard to judge people's hearts, but um, in your experience, what percentage of pastors actually go into the ministry because they want to draw closer to the Lord themselves and be there for people that want to do that, um, as opposed to, you know, whatever other motive, because one of the things like our, our audience is a YouTube audience. Yeah. And so a lot of our people have had mostly experiences of pastors that were in it to try to get rich. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people, who have strong opinions about church online are people who were never part of a church that had a decent leadership um, and are were really only exposed to people that were, were greedy. Okay, so you got to break this down a couple of different ways. First of all, I the largest church I ever pastored had an average Sunday attendance of about 330 people which we understand church dynamics, that's a hard number yeah. to do, right? Right. Because it's in between all yep. kinds of things. And that was a church I pastored in Canada. 
But most of the churches I pastored were right around 200, what Lyle Schaller would call the middle-sized church. And those, uh, thank you, Lyle Schaller, he, he regarded those churches as the hardest to pastor. Like, you really have to be on your game, okay, to pastor a church of 200 people. It, it's the most work, and you have the most programs, and always underfunded. Right, so you can't hire people to help with. And when you yeah. hire a youth pastor, that's a big deal. Okay, so um, I, my experience is with the Evangelical Free Church of America and with those churches that are 200 and under, okay? Now, there are hundreds of thousands of churches in this country of all sizes, shapes, and description. Less than 5% of them are big churches. So big churches get all the headlines, okay? And they get the pastors that write the books and supposedly teach the rest of us how to make churches like theirs. I never paid attention to these guys at all, okay? Because my ministry has been with middle-sized churches. My experience with other pastors has been with pastors of middle-sized churches. And I'm going to say something nice about the Evangelical Free Church of America. There was a time when I knew literally scores and scores of these guys, okay? Not so much anymore, okay? And a new generation has come along, and whether that's advantageous or not, it's not my place to say. I think it's probably advantageous. We've had enough baby boomer leadership for one lifetime, I think. But the, the truth of it is that all of those guys that I met when we got together for prayer and things like that, almost all of them struck me as here trying to do the right thing for the right reason. These were people that got up every morning, got dressed, and went to work. Which is what you have to do if you're going to do it for a long time. And you have to weather the stones and the arrows and the whippings that, in the words of Tozer, um, uh, no man can uh, succeed in ministry that hasn't first learned how to take a beating no matter who holds the whip. And I don't like that. I, that's something I totally preach against but it's still nonetheless true okay all these guys that i met i would say 80 90 percent of them were like that now the other 10 percent were often uh, people that had moral failures or they shouldn't have been in the ministry in the first place and i think really when it's all said and done and this gets sorted out over time there's probably 30% of all of us that agree to take on church leadership as pastors who don't belong there. Um, and most of them, in my opinion, are just too nice. Okay, And so they get pushed around, and they have rubber spines, and you can't do that. Um, churches actually know this, okay? Um as you can imagine, no church that ever called me to be their pastor was looking for somebody they could push around because they knew right out of the gate, this ain't going to work, but our church is a mess, and we need somebody to step in and, and bring it together and give it some direction, which often revolved around building projects, but that's a whole different story. So um, the... The overwhelming majority of men at the stage I was in, okay, I respected the and still respect pastors of really larger churches. And let's say from a church of 900 people on to however many thousands, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I have found, and I've read all the literature, I mean, they produce a lot of books thinking they know something, you know, they're s sniffing their own fumes and they write a book about it and, you know, the rest of us are supposed to look at ministry that way and I say, 
nuts to you. Um, but um, many of them, in my opinion, when they reach that phase, money is a big thing. Okay. Um, but had I ever been asked to be the pastor of a large church like that, I can't tell you, I would like to think that I would not have been one of those. They're not all like that, but many of them are merchandisers. They're running a franchise. Um, they have a McDonald's on this corner. And when you go to their church, a Big Mac tastes the same there as it does down the street. And that's just a merchandising thing. To me, which restricts entrance into the kingdom of heaven if you don't buy into that. Okay, some of the rest of us don't have that luxury. Okay, um, like in your life, um, you may have a thing for money, but it's never going to show. Okay, <laughs> right? Yeah, I I don't. You don't. I, know I you don't. yeah. When they when they interviewed me uh, here, um, ten eleven years ago, uh, I remember somebody asked me. Uh, when I when they were hiring me to be the student pastor, um, how I felt about money, and I said, if I wanted to be rich, I never would have become a pastor, and I regret saying that because that was an excuse that they used to keep my family poor. Exactly. And it's not that I have a thing for money; I really don't. But I didn't understand going into it exactly. what how much money I actually needed to make in order to keep a family afloat, yeah. and. Uh, you know, so it's almost like uh, I feel like there are a lot of us out there in ministry who maybe do have a thing for money and we figure out a way to accumulate it. And there's a lot of us who don't because our intentions are different. Um, but churches will, in order to save pennies here and there, they will keep you and your family poor yep. and use your good intentions as, you know, uh, leverage to do it. Right. Yeah. Which is in a form, it's another form of control. Right. The old uh, Lord, uh, if you keep him humble, we'll keep him poor. Yeah. You know, and which is wrong. It's anti scriptural. Right. Which is another weird thing about ministry, right? How is somebody sitting in the church going to have the right attitude about money and how paying the pastor feeds into that? They're going to learn it from you, who happens to be the pastor. Sure. And in middle sized churches, you're often underpaid. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I want to get to a different topic. This has been good, but let's just, uh, so you said it's unbiblical. Is there anything about what we do as churches in America that is biblical? Because the early church didn't build buildings, right? right? They didn't have a light bill to pay because that didn't exist yet. Um, they funded the apostles in their missions. We know that, but um, I don't think it was with an HR department. Uh, I, what do you think? Do you think we, we have a chance of doing uh, the New Testament church thing with the way things are structured, or does it just not happen? I don't think it's the structure. Okay. Okay. And I have a little different opinion about that. Sure. Because I used to be really down on myself mm -hmm. about being a pastor that was involved in so many building programs. Yeah. For that very reason. Right. But stop and think about it. When the early church was born, they had a building. It was Solomon's portico. Yeah. At the temple. Right. They met under a roof, but it was a Jewish roof. Sure. Paul's ministry to the Gentiles took place at synagogues. Right where they had a special arrangement with the Gentile believers in Jehovah, he went to them. Sometimes it was a matter of walking across the room. Right. Okay, it wasn't like going out on the street and preaching the gospel. Acts 17 is the one exception. Yeah. Okay. So they had buildings. And the Jewish organization went on another 400 years after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Like which was the most important thing that happened in the early church was the destruction of that temple. But they still 
we're affiliated with the synagogues, but you can see in the New Testament the tearing of the fabric. You can see where the New Testament authors are telling them you can't be a Jew and a Christian at the same time. You can't be a Judaizer. I shouldn't say a Jew because sometimes people use the word Jew to refer to a race of people. Uh, and sometimes they do themselves. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is you can't live by the law and be a follower of Jesus Christ at the same time. How plain is that brought out in every single book of the New Testament? Okay. Um, because God did a new thing when he established the church. But they, there were still places they met. They met in homes. Okay. I used to think they only met in homes when I was became a believer, you know. Uh, no, they... <laughs> They met in homes. They met in synagogues. They met at Solomon's portico. They met uh, in a lot of different places. Um, and it's debatable when they built the first church church. Okay. Was it as early as the 200s? I don't know. But I don't think it was necessary. They had places to meet. The catacombs. Catacombs. Exactly. So they had places to meet. Our form is just a little bit different, okay? But here's where I think we don't hold a candle to the first century Christians. We talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit. They made sure that they followed early on Jesus' command to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We chatter all the time about the work of the Holy Spirit, and I don't think that many of us would recognize the filling of the Spirit if it bit us in the face. Um, because, for instance, Luke eleven thirteen, one of my favorite verses that you and I once had an interesting discussion about, um, where Jesus says, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Okay? We're not asking. And you know as well as I do, that's a present tense participle there. Yeah. That means asking and asking and asking right now. We have a doctrine of the Holy Spirit. We don't have a filling of the Holy Spirit like we should. And I don't think there's any hope at all for the church in America to be what God wants it to be until we make that right. Because we're, we're, we're going to church and talking about God like he's a potted plant. We're describing him. We know his attributes. So, so many books are written about the attributes of God. Um, and defining him. What he can do, what he can't do. And arguing various bits of theology, including the theology of the Holy Spirit. But how many people are doing what I would assume some of the members of the audience that you have are doing? If this is about mysticism, what are we really talking about? We're talking about connecting with God through the Holy Spirit. And that requires a surrender of control to what God's will is for our lives. Which we're afraid of. Well, and a church organization is not built to do that. No, it isn't. It's it's antithetical. No. Yeah. So then the pastor gets it in his little pastor brain. I'm going to preach a series on the Holy Spirit. These right. people need to be filled with the Spirit. And so you give them the doctrine of the filling of the Holy Spirit without saying, you come to my house tonight and we're going to pray for the filling of the Spirit. Hmm. They don't even do that with the elders. The elders or the leaders of churches typically spend endless hours in inane conversations about nothing that matters. When, if they were true elders, they would be seeking the filling of the Spirit. And probably telling you as a pastor, this isn't good enough for me. This going, talking about chalkboards and yeah. dry erase markers and parking lot stripes and all this stuff that we talk about. 
I want the real thing. I want that relationship with God that goes deeper. And uh, unfortunately, we, we just can't help but think that God cares that we get together and share our opinions. Yeah. I don't want my opinion. I want his opinion. I figured out right away that a lot of people think that going to meetings is kingdom work and that I don't think there's anything that's less kingdom work than sitting around a table and talking. Sometimes it's necessary, but it's not what we're here for. No. Okay. So a question I wanted to ask, uh, we don't have to spend a lot of time on this, but um, how much did all that stuff play into the church's kind of union with uh, politics and with the Republican Party? And when did you first notice that there was a problem? Oh, my goodness. Didn't I say don't go there? You okay. did. We don't have to. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. okay. So you have to understand it goes back to Ronald Reagan. Okay. And it goes back to Ronald Reagan and Jerry Falwell, those two people. Jerry Falwell put forward, forward the notion of the moral majority. And here's how this went. America is a Christian country, which, by the way, it is not. Okay? America is a country that has allowed Christianity to grow without getting in its way. Okay? There's a difference. We're not a Christian country. But Jerry Falwell said, we're a Christian country, and the liberals have come along and stolen our birthright by being humanistic, okay, by believing in philosophy, education, and all of those things. It was a total fabrication. And whether Jerry Falwell meant well or not is not for me to judge. He has a judge that he has to face. We bought into it. I bought into it. Like, this is a Christian country, and the liberals took it away from us. Okay? It's false. Now, Ronald Reagan, and, of course, the watershed in America between conservatives and liberals is what? Abortion. Not only did Ronald Reagan give the time of day to the anti-abortion people, he wrote a book about this subject while he was a sitting president. Okay? That's where this all came together for us. Abortion became the issue. Okay? And the whole concept that the liberals are out to harpoon our Christian upbringing really started. And I was there. John, I had a portrait of Ronald Reagan hanging on the wall of my study at the church. Talk about an idol. Now, you have to understand, I had a relationship with Ronald Reagan. He was my governor twice when I grew up in California. The only adult human being that ever said anything that ever made sense to me for all those formative years in my teen years was my governor, Ronald Reagan. And I listened to him faithfully on the radio. Okay? So I had a thing about Reagan. And then I began to actually look into the statistics. We are not nor have we ever been a country with a moral majority. We have always been split down the middle, going all the way back to Thomas Jefferson, Madison, Adams. Um, Washington was smart enough to see what was coming, and he got out before he had to deal with that. We have been split down the middle all the way from the Founding Fathers. And that's way more easy to trace historically than this crazy notion of moral majority. The other thing is, and this has just come out recently, our country is extremely racist. 
in my opinion. And that group of people that enabled this country to be racist, in other words, particularly racist towards black people, is the white church. And if there's anybody listening to me that doubts that, boy, you're behind the times. Because there's some good literature out there that's truthful. It's true. We have whole denominations, <clears throat> including one not too far from each and every one of us, whose whole purpose in starting was the promotion of racism. And so a lot of things have been happening. I would say moving on from the 80s into the 90s for me, but I was a little bit ahead of the game. And then into the 2000s for, bless their hearts, the millennials who were really came along and said, you know, it's just not true. I mean, our country is racist, but I'm not racist and I don't want to be. Stop talking to me. This is why so many of them have left the church. They don't care if people are homosexuals. Um, they maybe do care, but they're not anti-homosexual like so many of us have been. Um, so this whole mixture of politics, su Supreme Court justices, and we're being schooled by the current Supreme Court justices. Oh, you think because we're conservative, we automatically vote a certain way? Um, this whole tension has been based on several lies. And it doesn't seem like we can say anything about America unless we begin by saying we're the best country that ever existed. We're the richest country that ever existed. We're the most uh, militarily dominant country that's ever existed. We just have to admit that we're the best that God ever created. Has anybody asked God? And... Um, then we can talk about, yeah, there's some problems with, no, we do have systemic problems. And somehow, whether we like it or not, it's happening now. We're being torn away from all of those half-truths that we have believed. We didn't know any better. I'll, I'll grant us that. Um, but it's too late now to say we don't know any better because we actually, there's too much truth out there now. And uh, we actually, in the Black Lives Movement, movement, uh, however you feel about it, we crossed a line there. We're never going back. We're just not going back to white racism because we're running out of white people. People my age are dying at an alarming rate. Not only are we the ones that keep the battle going, but statistically, we're starting to diminish in size and influence. And that's why what's happening in the Republican Party now is happening. People don't want to be left behind. This is our country. Well, guess what? Yeah, should have had more babies. Um, or you should have come to a knowledge of the truth. You should have looked at our history and said, you know, our country has been big enough to do such things, but only when there's blood in the streets. Anybody who thinks we're all going to just sit down and um, come to terms with these things is smoking something. America never turns in the right direction in the words of Winston Churchill, until it's exhausted all the options. And that usually involves riots, blood, murder. We're just not as good as we think we are. Okay? I love this country. However, um, and my dad was a Marine, a career Marine, so I didn't have any choice. <laughs> but the truth is, when you just... We're supposed to be lovers of the truth. When you look at the truth, um, our system favors 
people that look like me. And uh, it was built that way on purpose. And so where we go from here, I don't know. I would just like us to start telling the truth and really like to see us separate the politics out. How, how much longer do the specifically like the church organizations that kind of maintain that Christian nation myth, how much longer do you think they have? Ah, but see, here's the one thing we know about organizations, whether it's a church or a Kiwanis yeah. or the Boy Scouts or the National Rifle Association, they are hard to kill. Yeah, Knights of Columbus still exists. Yes. No no offense to any Knights of Columbus people. I don't know anything about them, but they're still around. I do, and yeah. some of it is very unpleasant. <laughs> but it is hard to kill an organization. Yeah. It really is. Okay, but... So, but I could predict, oh, we're right on the edge sure. of change. Are we? I yeah. don't know. Well, like the temperance movement uh, got their way in the 1920s, and then it got immediately reversed. Yeah. And so you know, sometimes things change, but um, yeah. Okay. Um, a lot will depend on how much the women of this country get involved. Yeah. They... they um, as a general rule, they may not be prone to militias and guns like some of us men, but they have a lot of influence that goes way beyond the threat of violence. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I'm really sick of it, just to be honest. Um, I'm past being a disillusioned Republican. I'm absolutely sick of the whole thing. And it's, And my people are going to force us as much as we don't want them to, to address this eventually in a military manner. That just seems to be where things are headed. And um, I I don't like it at all. What do you mean, address it in a military manner? Uh, we may have to oppose militias oh. militarily. Yeah. And it wouldn't be the first time in our nation's history, by the way. Okay. Right. Um, it's the same impulse that prompted John Wilkes Booth to shoot the president. Well, didn't George Washington have to ride his horse into Virginia to put down the Whiskey Rebellion, like, right into his pres presidency? Yeah, but he was a producer of whiskey. Right. So I don't think that qualifies. No, right. <laughs> All I'm saying is... Uh, <laughs> We haven't completely settled into what we are. No. I, I, I don't think that's in our no. in our DNA. And we will always be many different things. Yeah. Okay. So it's a wonderful country. Sure. I think Canada is a wonderful country, but anybody who reads the news or listens to yeah. the news can tell you, and I'm a citizen of Canada, as you are, and a citizen of the United States, um, love Canada. A, but uh, they have their own yep. societal issues, and they're being forced to come to terms with some things that have happened there. So we're just being forced into it. We're running out of resistance. Yeah. And uh, I, I think it's too bad. I know that's very negative, but I just think, hey, I lived through the 60s, and... Anybody who remembers 1968, 1969 knows that our country has in it the ability to fall to pieces. Yeah. Okay? And to be violent towards its own citizens. Yeah. And um, so we're not all just one big happy thing. And this is why I'm not a progressive. I can't stand progressivism because progressivism is like, Again, smoking something. We believe that all we need to do is just sit down and talk about stuff and it'll all get worked out. It never works that way. We didn't get the civil rights movement because a bunch of people thought it was a good idea. We got it because uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and a bunch of other black people were willing to have their brains beaten in and get bitten by dogs and be in buses that were set on fire before the rest of us would say, okay, 
maybe they're serious about this. Hmm. You know, um, this is just America, and we we do have a part. A part of us is not uh, does not live up to the hype. Yeah. Okay. Again, sniffing our own fumes. Sure. All right. Um. But for the church, the thing that offends me the most is not our country. Yeah. People that don't know the Lord do what people that don't know the Lord do. But the fact that we would be so entrenched and so willing to follow. I have so many friends that would rather get their information about what's happening in the world from an obviously false Chinese website than to listen to our own president. Hmm. Okay. Believers, we cannot claim to be people who love the truth if we're not willing to embrace the truth. 65% of us are not willing to embrace the actual truth about our country, and it doesn't help anything. Hmm. Um, 65% of believers. And we vote. That's why we have so much power right now but it's diminishing like i said we vote abortion is our main standard but even that as the standard that holds the flag behind which we line up is changing well i i know quite a few people who would probably still fall into um an anti-abortion camp me but they're tired of being jerked around by that one issue. Yes. And tired of using that as an excuse to ignore other issues right. that are very important. Yeah. But to this day, my number one thing is I am anti-abortion. Okay. That doesn't make me a conservative, nor does that mean that conservatives who want to sidle up to me are acceptable it's just that to me has always been the main thing mm. um but there are other things yeah you know and i d i don't think the church has handled it as much in a church way as it should have we've invested billions and billions of dollars in the legal arguments and trying to get certain justices elected and all of that stuff it's a free country you can do that but still um, not spending enough money. Some of that money should have gone to making massive programs for pregnant women. Not just the little programs that we have, but massive programs for pregnant women to get them through college, to, to help them, or if they couldn't do it, to find a good home for their their babies where they didn't feel like they were under threat of going to hell but they were actually encountering people that actually loved them and loved those unborn children which I think is a sentiment that exists among Christians but you sure couldn't tell it if you were a non-believer um, when you drive down the road and you see sign after sign after sign that says abortion is murder. Okay, I believe abortion is murder. But if I'm a, a woman that grew up in a non-Christian home? You've also got the same people um, trying to push like abstinence-only sex education in school and denying like birth control methods and stuff to people. And so... Let we, me ask you, is that biblical? What? Do you think that's... A biblical point of view abstinence only education yes. no and uh <laughs> i also think that it doesn't work and so you have to pick are you going to um are you going to hate people because they had an abortion or are you going to hate people because they have sexual desire and it just seems way too much like we're trying to control every aspect of people's right. lives 
and hold them to some standard that none of us reach right. ever. And that is kind of nonsense to begin with. Can I say that it's, I think it's always been slanted against females? Well, absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Because if a young man is part of the joining of a sperm and an egg, what does he do? He goes on to college usually. Right. What does the woman do? Yeah. She is stuck with trying to figure out Yeah. Uh, how am I going to raise this child? Yeah. Or am I going to raise this child or do I get an abortion? And, and when it comes to purity culture and things like that, we expect women to be pure according to some Bronze Age standard that didn't even exist. Uh, and we just... A lot of people do the uh, boys will be boys thing when it comes to young Still men. to this day. And neither one of those is a great attitude. Yep, it's yeah, it's not. No. Nope. Um, so you can have babies. You just don't want to be the woman. Yeah. So it's... No, and Christian Christianity in this country could have started off this whole thing a whole lot differently if instead of cramming the 136th song down people's throats, we started with the Beatitudes. The 136th Psalm is very intriguing, worth preaching. But as far as how we apply ourselves to the problem, had we started with the Beatitudes, uh, people might actually, like in the first century, you know, the Romans had a terrible record of exposing children. And exposure meant you looked at your baby and you said, I don't want this. And you took it out to the local park and left it there and walked away from it. Yep. And the birds came and pecked out its eyes and it died and it, where people took those kids and and took them to brothels or right. or temples and raised them or made slaves the, out of yeah, them yeah in sex trade, but some of the early Christians, as is pointed out by Rodney Stark in his Rise of Christianity, went and did something about it. They paid for the burials of people that were just left to rot on the street, out of their own pockets, because they had a respect for humans because they're created in the image of God. You know, we're, again, we talk about being full of the Holy Spirit. We just don't do it. Yeah. Okay. So then it's our political opinion against somebody else's political opinion. And you did it first. No, you did it first. You said this. No, you said that. And then we're arguing, endlessly arguing, to the point that a lot of people that could make a difference can't take it anymore, and they just turn off the news, they turn off the whole argument, they don't even think about it, you know? And I I feel for them. I don't believe they're doing the right thing by just tuning it out. But I do feel for them, right? It's sickening. Yeah. It, I mean, it's hard to know what adding your voice to the melee is actually going to accomplish. Uh, or it's, it's, it's probably even harder to know what being a sponge for everybody else's shouting is going to accomplish too. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, um, a lot of the, the unrest and the tension in the church and in society for you um, always pulls you toward uh, the all of the discourse in the second coming of Christ. I've noticed that about you, like from when I was a little kid, when stuff would happen, then that seemed to be where you went just kind of naturally. Um, so tell me about that. Tell me where you're at with that right now. Well, one thing I've found lately that um, made me smile is when you guys were growing up, we used to do a Christmas newsletter every year, your mom being the writer that she is and the absolute creative soul that she is. 
we produce some really cool newsletters. And in a lot of places, you'd get this newsletter, and she would break it down. Okay, what's Mike up to these days? What am I up to? What's John up to? Lydia and Melody. And they were always really well done. And it was mostly her influence, okay? Um, but I've noticed, I, I found, she put them all in a three-ring binder. And I had one of those that she gave to me. never had time to look at it. And I've been going through some stuff lately. And I found that and I started going through there. It seems like invariably she says something like, Mike, or dad, is still really concerned about the direction of the evangelical church in America. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. that? That line always made it in there. So apparently, yeah. uh, if I didn't gain any followers, at least your mother noticed that yeah. I was, I've never been at peace with the evangelical church in America. I just never have. Because I spent so much time learning the scriptures and seeing what's offered there. And seeing that we live so far below the level of our benefits. Okay, in a nutshell, which encompasses years and years of study, I went to a Bible college that taught dispensationalism. And dispensationalism is the whole pre-trib rapture, um, left-behind series theology Um that so many evangelicals in America hold to, okay? I knew right from the beginning, when I just learned there was a difference between the Old Testament and the New, that there was something wrong with that system. Yeah. I just never, and my pastor speaking, you know, the, I spoke favorably of, he taught me so much theology. When he got to that subject, I would tune him out because I would think, how do you get this from the Bible? You keep telling me that reading the Bible literally is the only thing that any human should ever be involved in. And yet when you get to the Olivet Discourse and the second coming of Jesus, you are clearly teaching me theories that are a real stretch. You have to tie yourself up into pretzels over and it's false. So to graduate from college, I had to sign on to dispensationalism. By the way, speaking of famous people that have had an influence in my life, Jerry Jenkins, one of the authors of um, the um, Left Behind Left Behind series, whose son is the one producing those excellent um, chosen podcasts now, okay, I met Dallas when he was 10 years old. He was a skinny kid with big ears. Um, and uh, I I had a friendship with Jerry, but I never followed him down that path, never read a single Left Behind book. At one time, I was the only one I knew, okay, because I didn't think it was true. So one time I went on a fishing trip up into Canada from Bible college, uh, with a friend of mine named Brian Brooks. And um, his family had a cabin up there. We went to the cabin, and I got there, and I looked around, and I didn't have my Schofield reference Bible. For those of you that are too young to know what that means, never mind, okay? But I didn't have my Bible with the notes in it that was trying to train me to think like a dispensationalist, like there's a pre-trib rapture, for instance. And so I asked to borrow a Bible, and they gave me a Bible with no notes. And I was like, uh, okay, well, hmm. And I just happened to be reading the last part of the Gospel of Matthew at that time. And I always knew that I had doubts, and I knew that to open that Bible without those notes, I was asking for trouble. But I was already there. I just closed my Bible and said, no, it's false. It's just false. And so many good people that I trusted and looked up to had taught me these very things. But I had to say, I'm sorry, including my first pastor. This is where we part company. And back then, you could get fired from a church, your whole missionary career, um, 
you could be persecuted for not buying into that. And the whole thing was invented in the late 1800s, mid to late 1800s. doesn't go back to the New Testament. No matter what they tell you, do the math. It doesn't go back to the New Testament. So at, at that point, I thought, at the very least, we're talking about a post-tribulation rapture. And the more I've studied it, um, like we talked yesterday, every twice a year, I make my annual foray into um, the end times. And I'm always joking, and I think sometimes it irritates you. Uh, I always say, uh, I might be the only person that still believes in the second coming of Christ. And you'll say, stop saying that. <laughs> and I'll say, well, then prove it. Why aren't we talking about it? Okay? Because the truth is, we have so messed up that all that the Bible teaches about that, we have so screwed it up, and we have so mangled what the Bible teaches that it's another area where people just tune it out. Yeah, I know. People fight over this all the time. It's too bad. Because where I am is, there's, there's two things where I am. Most of the stuff that Jesus predicted in the Olivet Discourse. Now, for those of you that think, Olivet Discourse, where is that? Okay, think Luke 17 and chapter 21. Think... Uh, Mark 13, and think Matthew 24 and 25. And that's where the disciples came to Jesus and said, uh, what will, uh, when will these things happen, and what will be the sign of the end of the world, basically? Okay. Then he launches into what's called the Olivet Discourse. It's called that because they're on the Mount of Olives. Okay. And things have been building up in the life of Jesus with the religious leaders of Israel, where he already told them, you're going to kill me for the things I've said. You're just going to do that. And uh, because that's what you do. You just kill everybody that God sends to you. So two things. Number one, most of that has already been fulfilled. It's already done. And it happened in AD 70. There were eyewitnesses. Josephus wrote it all down exactly as Jesus predicted. It already happened. It was leading up to the destruction of the Jewish temple, which was symbolic of God setting the Jewish system that he invented aside so that he could have a new people, a new group of priests, a new group of kingdom followers, that weren't necessarily Jewish. Now, ironically, most of them were Jews. Almost all of them were Jews in the beginning. Okay? But the door was cracked open for the whole exclusive Jewish system to be set aside in judgment so God could raise up a new people, the people that are not of this sheepfold. Okay? Um... And if you look at the Olivet Discourse from the standpoint of what's already been fulfilled, most of it has already been fulfilled. The only thing left is for Jesus to return at what we call the second coming. And let me just say that in Hebrews, Hebrews is very specific about all of these things having to do with the temple and the sacrifices and everything. Jesus is not coming in judgment like the dispensational system teaches. God is angry. You know, forgive me for saying this, but there was a bumper sticker that used to be on the back of a bunch of Christian cars um, that used to read, um, Jesus is coming again, and this time he's pissed. No. He came in judgment on the Jews the first time. It's easily provable from Scripture, by the way. He came in judgment the first time. Hebrews tells us the second time he comes, he's not coming in judgment. He is coming to rescue us from our own wicked, brain-dead selves. Because we made a mess 
of this thing that he's given us called planet Earth. And in spite of all the argumentation about what we're going to do to make it right again, to snap back to normal after COVID and all that, we're not going back to that. We have crossed too many bridges. We have created too much destruction on this planet. By ideas we thought were really good, like that ship that burned right to the water in the Gulf and destroyed how much wildlife? Unbelievable. Um, we just keep doing it. We're going to do it again and again and again and again. We've got such an issue now with vehicles. They're not going to get replaced by non-polluting vehicles. Even lithium batteries are pollutants. Everything we try to do, we stumble, we trip over it, we think we're so smart, we're not smart at all. When Jesus comes again, he is coming to set things right. Um, in the words of the Audio Adrenaline, that ancient Christian rock group, a mighty good leader is on the way. We are failing. We will continue to fail. This is why I'm not a progressive. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. We just keep failing. The judgment that's going to fall on the world is already falling now. We need to be rescued. And Jesus is coming a second time, not with judgment, but to save us from ourselves. Judgment has already happened. Um, and I like to point out to people that John actually believed when he wrote the book of Revelation way earlier than we think he did, that he believed he was in the tribulation. Jesus taught his early disciples, in the world you will have tribulation. It's not a different word. It's the same word, thlepsis. We're in trouble now. We're not going to get into trouble and then Jesus is going to come and punish people. We're already in trouble. And we're already being punished. And we're already being punished. Which falls in line beautifully with John chapter 3. Revelation to people that listen to John's podcasts. John has three, has more than one verse. Read the whole thing. We're doing things to ourselves. And God had strong feelings to go into another discussion John and I had at the dinner table last night. John had strong, uh, God had strong feelings for this world. So much so that he sent his son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Um, that's the remedy. That's the atonement that's the ultimate final atonement offered by God for us there's nothing else after this by the way it's it's the atonement of Jesus or it's nothing that's why Jesus came the first time so all of that to say um, where I am I believe in a literal second coming. Actually, everybody of all stripes do believe in a literal second coming. It's just that when they, they start to explain what they mean by that, they trip over their own language and their theological brilliance um, is obviously not quite what they think it is. Um, we all believe in a literal second coming of Jesus, those of us that believe the Bible. And But I believe that the Bible clearly teaches, Matthew 24 and 25 teaches, that at the second coming, um, people are going to be building houses, having babies, going on about life, trying to be normal after pandemics and stuff like that. They're just going to be preoccupied with stuff that is not what matters in the long run. That's when Jesus is going to come. That's why people don't expect him, because they're too busy buying houses, and they're too busy going to church, and they're too busy trying to have an influence on this or that, or too busy trying to raise their kids. Um, 
it's not going to be nearly the left behind stuff that we read about all the time. So that's where I am. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. I'm tired of people stepping forward with solutions to problems and making them worse. That's what we seem to be bent on doing, making everything worse, just like the uh, Eve in the garden. Um, she thought she was doing the right thing and just made the whole situation way worse for us humans. But we seem to validate her choices all the time. And so we need to be rescued. And that, I think, is what the second coming is all about. So, but we want people burning and people in hell and helicopters falling out of the sky and all that stuff. We also, for some reason, we want God to hate the world. Or at the very least, for him not to care very much about the world. And I don't get that. I do. Okay. Okay. We want God to hate his son, Jesus. Yeah. Why? Punishment. We have this theory that we keep preaching, and the ones that are the best at preaching it are Baptistic. Sorry. That God is so angry about sin, can't tolerate sin. Sin is so evil in his sight that in the process of dealing with it, he killed his son. So he could be happy. Boy, just take a breath and read what the New Testament actually says about the death of Jesus. But why does that, why do we want to imagine that kind of God? Because it's not just Christianity. I mean, yeah. like lots of religions going way back have had that sort of frustrated, angry, judgmental, aloof, but also, but also um, violent God at the center of. So I'm going to ask you a question yeah. that I know you know the answer to. If you were living in the first century, yeah, say in the days of Paul, mm -hmm. okay. And you, you saw that so many people believed in that kind of God. Both uh, Romans and Greeks and your Jewish countrymen. Okay, right. Yeah. But where did that influence really come from at that time? Because now, yeah. let, me, let me set the Jews aside for a second. At the birth of Jesus, or the conception of Jesus, Mary wrote a beautiful poem about how great God is and how he fulfills his promises and how just wonderful God is for even recognizing that we're here and we need help. Yeah. Zacharias, same thing. Okay. Anna and Simeon at the temple, right. pretty much the same thing. Okay, Elizabeth, the same thing. I'm talking about the first two chapters of Luke now. Right. Okay. There were lots of Jews that had a different opinion of God. Sure. Okay. Where was that impulse coming from? It was coming from Greek philosophy particularly Plato. Don't forget, the Greeks had a generalized concept of one God. Right. We think of them as, uh, as idol worshipers. In many ways, they were. But they had the one God concept. Yeah. And that was a God that didn't care for humans or what they went through, which is why Hebrews points out, we don't have a high priest that can't be touched with our humanity. Mm -hmm. We have a high priest that came as a man and took on our humanity out of empathy. So Plato's whole thing is that um, 
the material reality is dirty and vile and a corruption of the spiritual reality. And so, you know, if you're going to glorify God or whatever your concept of God is, you have to keep pushing God farther and farther away from material reality to the point where it disgusts him. Yes. Um, so then if you're made up of material reality, yeah, he, he's disgusted with you too. So this is why so many Christian heretics in the beginning would say Jesus didn't come in a real body. Yeah. He, he just came and looked like he was in a real body. Right. Because they couldn't handle, they couldn't handle a father who could say, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. If that meant that he was a human being. Right. So are we, are we projecting our self hatred onto divinity? Yes. And when we find people that don't do that, we have to make them hate themselves in order to be part of our little club. Right. Which yeah. came into the church through the Catholics. And Selma of Canterbury. Oh, sure. But uh, it was there before. In the second century, Origen was pretty good at hating himself. I know. Yeah. I know. And I he know. was a and he was a Plato scholar. He, yes. he literally yes. was a Plato scholar. I know. Yeah. But really, Anselm helped the Catholics. Sure. And many Catholics have moved away from that. Yeah. Like Richard Rohr. Sure. Okay. They don't want any part of that kind of God. But the people that are keeping that alive right now, we call small b Baptistic. Right. And when you listen to how the gospel is preached. Yeah. God is an angry dude. Yeah. And you're going to get punished. You're going to hell. Yeah. Okay. People, just stop and ask yourself, or even open your Bibles, okay? How many times did the apostles of Jesus actually threaten people with hell? Right. And what were the circumstances? Yeah. They had no problem imagining false teachers in hell. Sure. If you messed with the gospel of Christ and you went to hell, fine. They they also say things like, uh, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. But that, to just equate that as a one-to-one, -one, your eternal conscious torment is not faithful to what Within they... a context where Paul is saying, that's what I did my master's thesis on, was yeah. those statements. Within a context where Paul is actually struggling with people through yeah. their own personal behavior. Yeah. You don't say stop visiting prostitutes to people that aren't visiting prostitutes. Right. And what he's trying to do is exhort them. Okay. This is how the people of the world live. This yeah. isn't how Christians live. Right. Knock it off. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. it just we're we're too hell centered. Yeah. And I believe in hell. It's just the way to preach the gospel is not to start with hell. The other thing that N.T. Wright has pointed out to us in spades is we've got to stop preaching Jesus like he's a ticket to heaven. Right. Believe in Jesus so you can go to heaven. That is not the way the early apostles preached Jesus. Right. Believe in Jesus because he atoned for your sins and the Jewish system is no more. This is the God's final answer. Yeah. Okay. And they never led them in prayer. Like we're like, if somebody wants to accept Christ and we say, let's pray together. Let's pray. Pray after me this prayer. They never did that. Does anybody ever stop and ask why? It's because we are imposing our psychological neediness. Yeah. Yeah. And our need to have people punished on the Bible. Hmm. It says that God so loved the world. Okay. Then it goes on to say in John 3, by the way, there's more than one verse in John 3. It goes on in John 3 to say, if you don't connect with that, it's on you. It's not on God or Jesus. It's not their fault. It's your fault. You're choosing something else. Yeah. What the apostles said to the church was, you don't have the right to choose something else and still call yourself the church. God has one solution 
This yeah. is it, Jesus. So when Jesus died on the cross, and you know the answer to this too, um, the the question among atonement scholars is, um, if Jesus on the cross, dying on the cross, um, was writing a check, who cashed the check? Right. And everybody says, God. Yeah. Because God had to punish him for us. Yeah. Isaiah doesn't say that God punished him. Isaiah says, we esteemed him as stricken, smitten of God. Yeah. That's the way we looked at him. Right. That doesn't make it so. Yeah. Well, Ezekiel and Ezekiel, God says very clearly, it doesn't please me when people suffer and die. Right. Punishment doesn't make me happy. I don't like no. it. Right. No, he doesn't like it. I had some friends in uh, in Bible school who were, as a lot of young pastor type kids are, uh, they got really into Jonathan Edwards, right? And so I remember going to the library and getting Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God and reading it and just closing it and going, none of this is in the New Testament. None of it is. It's just not. And you the, know what? The, I remember there's the, the line where he says that, you know, like a man with a spider on a sheet of paper feels disgust for the spider and dumps it into the fire and feels satisfied. That's how God feels about us when he punishes a sinful soul. Right. I remember going, this is not in right. there. Right. Yeah. And there have been people that have stood up against that. Martin Luther, sure. in my opinion, is a hero of the faith. And you know that there was a period of time in my life where I was disgusted with Luther. But I've come back. And I've actually understood what he was trying to say. Um, but Jonathan Edwards himself, in their eternal wisdom, how did his church end his ministry? I don't know that part of his story. They fired him. He was the creator of that um, enlightenment or that, uh, what do we call it? Awakening. Uh, awakening, right? He ended his days being a guinea pig for smallpox vaccine among yeah. Indian people. And he died. They gave him too many, too much smallpox. Yeah. Um, but really, the truth is, if I could change any perception. See, my whole life has been dedicated to helping people read the Bible. Because everywhere I go, I meet people who have been Christians for a long time who don't know how to read the Bible. They've been taught too many systems and too much theology and too many schemes of how to read it without actually reading it word by word, by verse, by verse, by pronoun, you know, preposition. You've got to slow down. Yeah. Okay. And read it phonetically. So both of my granddaughters, my older granddaughters, I have a younger one, are excellent readers. Both of them have parents that insist on they learn how to read phonetically. That other way of learning how to read leads you to not being able to pay attention to what's actually going on. Sight words. Yes. Yeah. So we need to read the Bible phonetically. Slow down. Don't start with the assumption that God hates Sinners, mm -hmm. read the Bible and find out if it's actually true. Mm. And if I could change anything about the way people read the Bible, it would be to restore the fatherhood of God to people. We have a great father. He's fantastic. And he knows how to be a father. Fortunately, the word says, I barely know how to be a father. <laughs> the word is not really all that. It doesn't give us a lot of pats on the back, does it? No. But this one, God the Father, knows what fathering is all about. And we have a great father. I wish I could restore that sense of the fatherhood of God to people. Yeah. It would change so much of how they read the scriptures. It also changes how you approach your life in the world. Yes. Because if the God who created the universe is 
a loving father and is on your team and is telling you where you've missed the mark because he believes that you can do better and is committed to your success and sends his son and sends the Holy Spirit uh, to get you there. Um, you know, that's something that I can, I can build a life on. Right. If God's mad at me yep. and Jesus covers me from that and I got to make sure that I don't offend him again because, you know, I only get one, one sacrifice of Christ to cover all my sins. And if I sin again, then I'm toast. Um, I, even if I remain faithful out of fear, that's not a God that I can get to know. And no. it's not a God who helps me with, no. with, with what no. I need help with. Yes. Yeah. So going back to your first question, when I first became a believer, I had a sense of the presence of God. Uh-huh. That sense has never left me, ever. I've tried to leave it. Yeah. I mean, I've even, the Lord and I have had it out on this subject. Right. Um, but it has never left me. And... I've never doubted God in the way that people think of doubting God. Nowadays, it's almost, it's like wearing hip-hop clothing for some people. I mean, it was it was cool, like, in the late 80s when Nine Inch Nails came out, and now we, we're we past it. It's not cool anymore. Yeah. Yeah. But people just have to, <laughs> have to... Be bold and say, I'm brave. I challenge God. Yeah. Uh, or I stop believing in God. Um, I just, I've never been somebody that has said anything other that, than that God is God. Yeah. And that's just the way it is. Now, as far as um, certain things that have happened that I've seen, they don't cause me to disbelieve that. But I am able to say that there are things where I've said to the Lord, I don't think I'm ever going to understand this. Mm. But it doesn't change the fact that you have the right to be God. And frankly, contrary to many of my friends, I think you're doing a good job. Um. And I think, you know, 95% of Americans always poll as believing in God. But I think about maybe 60% or less of Americans believe that he's doing a good job. It's kind of an interesting thing about America. We think he needs a performance review, which is why he always seems to poll under Oprah Winfrey or somebody like that, right? Um, and a yeah, lot of it is even our, the idea that we would poll each other on how, like how good of a job we think God is doing. Right. The planet's flying through space. If you <laughs> could get in your car and drive <laughs> about five or six miles straight up, you would be yeah. out of the atmosphere. Yes. And yet we all still have air to breathe. We have eyes and lungs. Yeah. You know how? Wow. So it's um, I we we come at God wrong and therefore we take certain statements of scripture wrong like he's just waiting to punish you know that's what he's sitting up in heaven doing and it's not true he takes no pleasure in at the end of the book of jonah he says he loves the ninevites or he cares for them and he cares for their cows yeah like their cows right you know Jonah, being the jerk that he was, it's like they care about their cows, like sparrows. Apparently, yeah. There's a dead sparrow in our lamppost outside the house, and apparently, God knew that sparrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Jonah says, "Here's my problem with you. You don't know what it means to be God." Because I know you. You might just, when I preach to these people, you might just let them off. That's not what the God I want does. Right. The God that I want cooks them. Yeah. Like a bunch of crickets in a campfire. Um, and 
I know you. I can't trust you to be God. I can trust you to change your mind. Which is such a weird, strange, awful thing. But there's a lot of Jonas. Yeah, and he's also saying, why are you making me go tell them Yes, that you're upset or that they should change their ways if you're just going to forgive them anyway? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So think about that preacher who's in... So then it's either North or South Carolina, I can't remember which, who said not too many years ago, well, what we should do with gay people is we put them all on an island, put a fence around it, and just not bring food to them. Right. And I'm thinking, and you represent God. I heard a pastor say that um, we're wasting our nuclear weapons if we don't use them to wipe out the entire Middle East and start over. Right. Right. God has his people everywhere. He had to teach that to Elijah. Yeah. You're not the only one left. Yeah. And you want me to cook the earth. Right. He taught that to the sons of thunder. Yep. You want me to boil them? Fry them? Fricassee them? What, what is it you want? Barbecue them? Yeah. You don't know what spirit you're of or what I'm here to do. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. So, and that, those uh, human tendencies exist still a lot. <laughs> yeah. And uh, unfortunately, we bill ourselves as the representative of God himself. Yeah. This is why when, during my preaching years, I made every church, not that I cared what was in any bulletin that was ever printed, but they just insisted on printing bulletins like they were going out of style. Like there were enough trees. Right. <laughs> like there were enough trees for all these bulletins and their inserts. But whenever a bulletin read God's word to us or something like that, I made them stop doing that. Mm -hmm. I do not claim to speak for God. Now, if somebody says to me, and I can think of a few people that might, but you have spoken for God, that's not my problem. I do not speak for God. Yeah. And frankly, I find understanding God to be beyond the walnut that is my brain. Um, but I'm in good company, so did Paul. Yeah, and... Uh all the mystics I read, it's the number one thing that we start with. You're not going to be able to sketch him out. Right. And everything you do to try yes. or to put a leash on him is leading you away from the reality at the center of existence. Yeah. yeah. But this Sunday, a lot of us are going to get a gathering of people sitting in front of us, and they're going to say, okay, I'll give you 20 minutes to explain God to me because we're taking mom out to lunch. Yep. Which I think only matters if you're taking mom to Kirai. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You've got, you've got 20 minutes and we know you're going to take a half hour because you always say 20 minutes and it's never 20 minutes to give me a little bit of God. Yeah. Give me that little shot that little saccharine pill, so I can understand it, and then I have stuff to do. Yeah. And this is why I'm so hard on church people. It's shame on you. Shame on you that you don't do your best to get away from people, the screaming kids, the car payments and everything, and sit down and open that book and go, what does it really say? Yeah. Shame on you. If you're depending on some pastor, and I did it for 40 years, do the math how many sermons that must have been. Um, I, I, I did it for 40 years, and I always resented that people treated God like that and treated me like that. Yeah. Once had a woman say in our church in North Dakota, interesting church that it was, I'm not coming to church anymore. I'm like, okay, I'm surprised you come now. Why not? Because every time I come to church, 
it seems like you're bent on making me think. And I'm like, go on. And she said, I don't come to church to think. And I resent the fact that you make me think when I come to church. Has anyone given you a greater compliment than that? No. No. <laughs> no. Yeah. Oh, no. Yes, someone did. A deacon at a church that I pastored in Illinois where you were born. Yeah. Looked at me and he said, the problem with you is you're too biblical. Oh. It's like, man, Jim, if you wrote me a check for a hundred bucks, you couldn't make me feel any better than I feel now. Yeah. But he... He, he was not a godly man. He was not yeah. a spiritual man. He was a man with some money who had opinions about everything, and people thought he would make a good church leader. He was miserable. Um, people don't realize how much of a connection we can make with God, but you have to invest the time. You have time for your boat. You have time for your Mustang. You have time for your pickup truck. Netflix. You have time for Netflix. You have time to binge ne binge watch Netflix. You have time for everything under the sun. But you want these little tiny droplets of godness dropped on your tongue. And shame on you. Just shame on you. Really. So it's not my fault. Yeah. It really isn't. So. Well, uh, now that you've absolved yourself, that's probably a good place to stop. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'm free of the blood of all men. Yeah. <laughs>